This is Ernest Gilbert with the VI Consortium here in Frederickstead for an exclusive interview with Delegate to Congress, Donna Christensen. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. How are you? Good, good, good. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Um, of course, you're vying uh, to become the next governor of the Virgin Islands. Yes, I am. How do you feel about it now? I feel very good about it. I, I feel very positive about it. Um, I think we get good responses as we move around the territory or as we do our phone banking. Uh, and as I go to the stores or wherever I am, I'm getting a very good response. I'm on all three islands. Of course, there are a couple of challenges, you know, always have issues that come up uh, that are very controversial at times in an election year. It makes it a little more difficult. And so you're under a little bit of pressure from your constituents. Yeah. yeah. But um, I don't make decisions based on whether somebody's going to vote for me or not. Right. So, but I think it's very positive. And then, you know, looking forward, even though things are not as we would like them to be today. Yeah. Both Basil and I can see beyond today and see possibilities that we know that with our experience, our know-how that we have, the relationships that we have, uh, that we can uh, see beyond the horizon and see a brighter day for the Virgin Islands. Good. So starting off here, I'd like to ask about your grand vision as it relates to the economy of the Virgin Islands. As you know, we're in a recession, Ovenza is closed, we'll talk about that a bit later. Uh, you know. Wang Lui, the situation over there, the Virgin Islands on a whole, and more pointedly St. Croix, we are facing a lot, a lot of issues. What is your grand vision as it relates to the economy of the Virgin Islands? Well, and I grew up in St. Croix. I can't say I was born here, I was born in New Jersey, but I've been here since I was three months old, so this is where my heart is. And um, first of all, we want to make sure that the economy of the St. Croix and the Virgin Islands is resilient and sustainable. It's very important. We've uh, been battered about by different shocks, whether it was the global or the national recession and the Hovenza closing. We have to build an economy that's much more resilient than that, that's really based here and depend more uh, self-sufficient, I guess I would say. And so that's, that's one of the things. The other, and, and to do that, the foundation of our economy needs to be our small businesses. I've been on the Small Business Committee uh, for 10 years in my first 10 years of, in Congress. Did a lot of work on that. Continue, even though I'm not on the committee, to work with our Small Business, business Administration, the SBDC, EDA, and others, and working with small businesses themselves, looking for equity, private equity for them. Access to capital is a big issue for um, our small businesses, so we've talked with some private equity firms. We're looking at creating a, how we can create, and we know we can, so we're looking to create a a community development entity that can access uh, new markets initiative funding and other federal funding to support our small businesses. Speaking specifically about St. Croix and in this beautiful location, it's um, a very historic Pretty area nice, yeah. for the Virgin Islands. You know, I um, sponsored a bill to create an, a study for a national heritage area for St. Croix. As a matter of fact, one of the first meetings was held in this fort. And uh, we completed our study. It was done with the input of the community, and we're still waiting for the designation now. And that's been on hold for at least four years now. It took me six years to get the study. I've been doing this for about four years. There's a slight window of opportunity at the after the election and the lame duck session that we might be able to get a very small window. If if I don't get it this year, I'm you know working with Stacy. I want her to try to continue it because it. It helps to develop a different kind of tourism product for St. Croix. And it's a tourism product that's based on our culture, our history, the story of the people who have come over the years and who have made St. Croix what it is today. And it opens up an opportunity for more local small businesses to be involved in the sector that drives our economy, tourism. But yet it creates a tourism that preserves what we have instead of changing the island. And uh, so I, that's, that's my baby. And, and it comes with funding. It, uh, National Heritage Areas, of which there are about 40 or so in the United States, it has funding associated with it that can provide up to a million dollars a year for the first 10 years. And we have, a, we have our entity, it's a coalition of different not-for-profits, from agricultural ones to cultural ones to economic development and uh, you know, things that preserve our history. So, we have a management entity. We've done a couple of things in preparation for it. 
uh, all on St. Croix, the feasibility that? study for the small inns and bed and breakfast mm -hmm. that was funded by Interior. So we've done some of the groundwork to prepare us for that, and I'm, it's something I'm really excited about, and I think it can be really great for us. Okay, good. Speaking specifically about the economy again, and um, well, more pointedly, St. Croix, as you know, we're hurting. Uh, recently, uh, the Senate passed me a measure that would see residents paying for uh, the streetlights. Um, it was a very, very unpopular measure, mm -hmm. um, and you know what uh, people were saying is that we are already paying for streetlights via. Uh, um, uh, property tax. Are you in agreement with that measure? Well, you know, that's a very difficult measure. First of all, we're mandated by law to pass a balanced budget. And I really, and I think everybody appreciates or should appreciate the difficulty the budget the Senate had in passing a bal balanced budget. I would hope that we could find some other way to pay for it because we know that the people of the territory between WAPA, high food and other prices um, and low salaries and many waiting for retroactive monies to be paid really cannot take on another burden. However, when I look at it, when, it's not an additional payment we are making in our property taxes. It was a percentage of our property taxes that we paid that went to do that. And we're hoping that and I'm told that by January we should be experiencing, in St. Croix, even before St. Thomas, a 25 to 30% reduction in our, in our WAPA bill. Uh, we may be able to sustain it, but I would, um, because I think it'll just be a couple of dollars. Yeah, so. And, but I would like to see us find a different place to, to fund it from. That's one. And I'm saying that in a time when the Senate scrambled. Yeah. you know, to find money to balance the budget. So it, that's going, going to be very difficult. I, I'll tell you that fortuitously, or maybe, we'll have to look at the proposal. But someone came to me and said, uh, two weeks ago, you know, I want to talk to you about a proposal for a public-private partnership on your streetlights mm. that would save the government of the Virgin Islands some money. Mm. So I emailed the person over the weekend and I said, um, Please send me a proposal. I want to take a look at it. I don't know if it's going to work for us, but that might be an alternative that I can seek to not have so that everybody can realize the full deduction in their WAPA bill. Right, right. Because yeah. that's, been, that's been what people have been Can we, we've been paying high bills for so long. We've been suffering for yeah, so long. Yeah. And now we're about to get some relief. Can I we know. at least keep our relief? Can you know, leave it I as know, is? And so that's why the people and are... You know, uh, and I didn't even mention insurance costs. We got so yeah. many costs that yeah. have gone up. Oh, everything, you know? everything. Yeah. And so the people are concerned about that. Speaking of that, let's talk about Wang Lubi for a little bit. Okay, can uh, I just say another word? I mean, I didn't talk about the economy in a full sense sure, because we have to sure. find ways to bring revenue into the territory. And yes. I talked about uh, the community development entity and new markets initiative. But um, our EDC program and our RT Park are opportunities for us to bring revenue in a relatively short period of time if we can seek those companies out. One, if we can make sure that we fix anything that yeah. needs to be fixed in our EDC program and our RT Park to make them very competitive and, and very attractive. Uh, but that's a way to bring in funding and if we seek out the kinds of companies that we, we would like to have here to, to train and they yeah. must train and utilize some of our local uh, our residents, our local residents for those jobs. So that's, that's, that's one. We, we also have talked with people who have formed a, what is called an EB5 for the Virgin Islands and that invites foreign investment um, to the Virgin Islands that will create jobs and help our economy. And I intend to, as other p communities that have been in trouble, yeah. have done, maximize federal grants. And the federal government will work with us to look at the grants we have, look at the ones we, we are eligible for that we can't, that we haven't taken advantage of, and even looking at some we're not eligible for that we would want to be eligible for. So um, those are some of the things about the economy. Now, Wang Lui Hospital. <laughs> Wang Lui Hospital, we're going to get right there. Hovenza, uh, the governor said that a deal has been reached in principle. Uh, are you privy to what's going on with the uh, refinery? No, I'm not. No, I'm yeah. not. I, I, and even the senators don't seem to be privy to the specific details. Yeah. Uh, so I know what I know from speaking with them because they were invited to the meeting or from what I read in the paper that they have a potential buyer. Yeah. 
and the negotiations. I mean, I think it would be very good because that's the fastest way yeah. to bring back that, that facility as long as it, they refine a light crew that doesn't have the emissions that we, the communities have suffered from yeah. over the years and um, that they meet certain obligations to the Virgin Islands and the people of the Virgin Islands. Now to Wang Lui. Let's talk about that. You declared, or you said that the governor should have declared Wang Lui a state of emergency. He said he would not do that. He did not do it. Do you think it was a good decision by the governor? I would have preferred the state of emergency. At one time, initially he thought he might, mm -hmm. but he said, I, I, I probably will do it, but be, be prepared for a public outcry. Mm. And I, that's where we disagree. Yeah. He felt that it would alarm the public. I felt it would calm the public and have the public have confidence that we were doing everything we needed to do to not only save Wang Lui, but to save our, our people who live here who yes. need those services. So um, I, I, think, I think I was right. Yeah. People were already alarmed yeah. and needed to have their alarm, needed to have some calm and some security brought into their lives. I think the federal government would also see that we were very, very serious about it. But I, I, on, on behalf of all of us who worked on this, I w because the attorney didn't agree either, the attorney tried to talk me out of it. Right. Um, the response has been one that has been essentially an emergency response right. so far. Right. So I think that uh, despite not calling for it, I think everyone has recognized it for the emergency and that it is and the possible catastrophe that it would be if we were to be decertified and has acted appropriately. We learned today that uh, Wang Lui has averted uh, the accreditation. Um, CMS, however, they are very stringent and strict about what they would like to see uh, get accomplished. Yeah. Were you instrumental in seeing that deal come to fruition? Absolutely. Um, I've worked with the Wang Lui Hospital and CMS over the years uh, with the dialysis unit. We've averted other crises, other decertification possibilities in the past. And then I'm on the health subcommittee of Energy and Commerce, so all of the folks that, from the secretary and all of our directors have to come before my committee. And, and I'm, I'm a friendly side of that committee to them. And I've been very supportive. So uh, we have a good relationship. They, they really respect me and, and they respond anyway to congressional inquiries. But we, we have a good working relationship. So they responded immediately and began to you know, discuss it and were open to anything that would give them the assurance that the people of St. Croix would receive the care that they need and be safe in, in the hospital environment. And from there, uh, we met here and decided, well, let's go up there and have a meeting. And I met with the director of Health and, of, not of Health and Human Services, of, Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, the, the administrator and some of her key staff, and they agreed to the meeting. But they were very clear, hmm. very clear and very stern. We've been here before. Hmm. Promises have been made before. And we're here we are back again. And asked if she, if she would allow us to come and to make a presentation. And I, they agreed. And so that resulted in the meeting on Friday. So. I would say the call that I made opened the door for what we are looking at today and have it breathing at least a temporary sigh of relief, relief because there's a lot of work still to be done. Did get, how, how did we get there? You, you saw the, uh, <clears throat> the report, CMS's report, it's very daunting. Um, <coughs> a lot of um, inefficiencies, malpractice. How did we get here if we were there before um, and uh, we faced the accreditation before? How has you know the government allowed one way to lapse so often. Why do we always got to get to a crisis point and then try to fix the situation? But that's a very good question. We, I think we got here for a lot of reasons. Uh, now, finances are not the only reason, but when you think that at around 2008, Governor Wang F. Louis and Roy Lester Snyder would receive about 30, 31 million dollars a year, and now they're only receiving 19, 20, 29. You know, so that's a decrease in a time when costs of providing services are up. So they're operating from a deficit. Even Medicare doesn't pay them at the cost of which they deliver services, which is something, because in between CMS, I've been meeting with the hospital on other issues. 
patient care issues in some cases because the administration and the doctors are very con and the nurses are very concerned about those. So we had met on those before. But um, Medicare is one area where they've made an application to increase the reimbursement because right now they're losing money on providing services even to Medicare patients and to Medicaid patients as well. How is that possible? Because they have not had a resetting of their reimbursement rate since 1996. And they tried in 2002. We're a very data poor uh, community, uh, territory, so we didn't have the data to justify. Mm. In 2008, they tried again. It got there too late, so it was not considered. And so here we are. And one of the board members, uh, Mr. RCD, is, is a hospital financial. He has that kind of a background. And um, he's been very helpful in, in making the justification. And, and the CFO is put together the numbers, they're sending them out today. Let's talk about Nedra Dodds. Uh, she was recently hired by the Wang Flui Hospital. However, her license to practice was suspended in Atlanta. You do a simple Google search and you're going to find everything about her. Malpractice, she's been accused of, you know, killing two patients. Um, wow. there, there's extensive uh, uh, investigative reports on the internet uh, by reputable sources in the States. You could see it. Mm -hmm. uh, VI Consortium broke the story uh, last night, uh, to, really? yes, talking about it, and they hired her here. Um, we asked uh, Dr. Griffith today about the situation, and he simply said, you know what, we, could do we will do better next time, and he, that he is responsible for everything that goes on there. How could the hospital allow this to slip? Why would they, allow, they um, hire some, someone like this? And, I, you know, I, I didn't even really fully answer your previous question about what went wrong and why yeah. we, are we here. But uh, due diligence in all of our practices uh, uh, obviously has not been up to par. Uh, you, you can't hire someone without, I mean, I can't get, you usually you do a police search, you do a search on their credentials. At the very least, you go to that network where yeah. physician practices are reported. And um, so that was a real failure of, of in management. And management has been, has been a problem. And Dr. Griffith has really done a, a, a good job, a, a yeoman's job. He's very dedicated. His heart is really right with the Wang Louis Hospital and the people of St. Croix. But still, there, there were management issues. And there have been management issues even before. Yeah. But they've always stepped up, but then there's been turnover. Yeah. Yeah. Turnover in CEOs, yeah. turnover in yeah. nursing. We, we, I started out in the, 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 the dialysis issue with um, mm. Darius Plaskett. Yeah. And then when we tried to do some other things to bring money into the hospital, it was Jeff Nelson. Yeah. And, now, and now it's Kendall Griffith. So, yeah. and, and then the board was not Actually, fully constituted. Yeah. So. Management is indeed a problem, but I think the turnover and, and the management, the, the board not being in place and not, even when it was in place, perhaps not fully exercising its full authority. Um, shouldn't shouldn't yeah. someone be held and accountable so, for, for the hiring of, of, of a... The, in, when, norm, uh, in normal circumstances, yeah, I, you know, I was, I mean, most places, person would not be working. They would not be, yeah, you they know, um, and so, that's one of the things we're, we have we're, here. Uh, yeah, we're, Accountability. We're a small community, but we, we know that we have to manage the hospital and everything else better than we do today. And we cannot be about personalities and friends and special interests. We have to be have at, a, at the forefront of our interests, the interests of the people of the territory. And I, I'm, I'm sure Dr. Griffith is really committed to seeing this through. And I, I, you know, I don't, maybe he'll stay on. If he gets it done, maybe he'll go back to his practice. But I know he's really committed to seeing this too. But he is going to need a lot of support. You know, he may be better at management than I. I don't know. But we, we're never trained in that. Right. We're trained to provide a service to yeah. practice medicine. We're not trained in hospital administration. We're not even trained in business management. And most of us open up a practice yeah. and have to run a business. Yeah. You know. So, but his commitment and his dedication trumps a lot of what he doesn't have an experience so we're, we're going to work with him and then we'll see you know what is needed yeah. for sustainability of this of this, uh, hospital. this hospital because sustainability is the real key and you know we may ha we're going to have to have a full board and we'll see what what management 
uh, changes may be needed or improvements may be needed because yeah. they want to see strong, strong across the board management, yeah. not just the CEO. And consistency too. Yeah, not just the CEO, but strong management across the board. Let's, let's talk about something that a lot of the people see out here as it relates to you and your tenure as the, the delegate to Congress. You walk anywhere and people would say, well, you know what, the delegate's been in office for a very long time and the, you know, what has she done? You, I'm sure you've heard this before. I've heard it so many times. Yes, you've heard it so many times. Is it, is it that you don't, you don't make a good case of what you've done or is, are, there, are other people talking the truth? Have you done a lot for the Virgin Islands? Yes, I've done a lot for the Virgin Islands. Um, I'm the kind of person that, you know, I, if I take on a task, I'm doing it to the fullest extent. And if I can't do it, I generally would have stepped away. I, I, we did a lot of things that have benefited the people of this territory. What, what part of the problem is, the two, the two several reasons that this is said. One is we're one step removed from the actual use of funding or programs. So they see the sign saying the governor and lieutenant governor fix this road, but they didn't see that the delegate brought the money. They see another sign saying, especially the Recovery and Reinvestment Act, you know, my counterpart in Guam used to put her name on it also. I probably should have done that, maybe it would have helped, but I didn't see the necessity of doing it at the time. But we're one step removed, so people don't see when we increase the lie heap when we bring more money for Medicaid. And, and sometimes, and I've served with three governors, so I'm not pointing the finger at any governor, but sometimes the funding is not used effectively and efficiently for the purposes for which, which it's brought, so you don't see it. That's, that's one of the reasons that I thought a CFO may be helpful, because we want to make sure that when the money comes, we use it for the intended purpose, that the people feel the effect of that money or that program, and then we're not sending any money back, which which we have done too often for far too long. You you think you would so we've done a, a you know whether it's been in healthcare, whether it's been roads and transportation, whether it's been bringing more authority to the government of the Virgin Islands. Um, there, there are many things that we have done over the years, and really when we add up the amount of funding, new money, not not formula money, not money that the department would have gotten just because they exist. Right. But new money, it's it's in the it's close to two billion. I was about to ask you about that. Two billion more. About or less. two billion, as yeah. a, a, during the tenor. Yes. That's that's. that's we've good. we've increased programs that we were never eligible for. Opened up other opportunities for agencies to get grants and and other funding. We've done. We brought conferences, business conferences, especially small business conferences here. We brought. Um, we used to do one every year. We did well. We did it twice, once in St. Croix, once in St. Thomas. And then one of our papers, one of our um, businesses sort of interfered because they saw one of my sponsors as being competitive to them. And, and they really started to search out my sponsors, IBM and other big companies. And I just didn't want, I, I didn't want that to happen. So we never were able to do that again. But we brought the Carib News International Business Conference to St. Croix and St. Thomas. I brought health conferences. So we've. Um, help the economy in that way. We've also provided uh, opportunities for businesses to partner. We've provided healthcare information um, through those conferences as well. Um, I heard, I saw the other day that um, one of our senators was talking about finding someone to introduce an amendment for us to vote for president. I've, I've been doing that since the 108th Congress. We're now in the, in the 13th Congress. And so I've been doing that amendments and not passing these days. Right, you know, right, right, there's right. several amendments to the Constitution that have been offered. Uh, they're very difficult. And I really, I, I don't even have the full support of the other territories. I mean, they've signed on, but the actions that need to take place are not happening. All right, that's good. So your opponent, uh, your, what would, would people would say your main opponent, uh, has been going hard, really hard after you, and you've been going really hard after her. Um, we hear the, the negative campaign in, uh, you know, who's sleeping on the job and who's, you know, uh, who's vindictive. Um, the negative campaign, they work. Uh, what do you think about it? I mean, do you think it's, 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 it's something that's healthy for the community? Because, you know, it's, it's, it's prevalent out there right now, whether it's on your side or, you know, via Aristo Hope or on your opponent's side. Um, let me just answer another part of the previous question. I'm going to answer it, though. 
But um, what people don't see, at lot, the community at large, is the, cons the constituent work that we do and my staff do. Every day, whether it's immigration, whether it's somebody in the military, whether it's a veteran, whether it's somebody who is owed money by the federal government, whether it's somebody that needed a Twix card mm. and was losing their job because... So you're helping those areas? Oh, hundreds of people, hundreds of people every year, hundreds of people, and the, and the students that we support through internships, scholarships, fellowships, through programs that bring students to, to Washington to ex, ex, have a different experience and to learn different things, especially those that were interested in healthcare when we had that program. So people don't see all of those things which really contribute. Okay. <laughs> um, you know, I have never run a negative campaign. You've never run a negative campaign? No. And I, I'll tell you when the Irish, and they would confirm this, when the Irish store hopes Saturday, as I call them and tell them, please. You, know, you call them? Please yeah. pull them. <laughs> you know? They didn't pull them, though. They no, they didn't. <laughs> they didn't. Because I, I'm not paying for them. Yeah. You know, they, they're paying for them. And obviously, my opponent has uh, either, I, I don't know if it's saying has made enemies, it's a, a little too strong, but there are people that feel very strongly about his past and his history and, and would not want to see him as governor. And, you know, um, but my campaign has always been a positive campaign. As a matter of fact, people wrote some ads for me in the primary and I told them I'm gonna have to run them. I'm just not gonna run them. I'm not, I'm not running them. But um, I will respond though yeah. to negative attacks on my, on my record or on me personally. And I will point out facts. Um, because it, we run on our record. I, anybody can promise anything. Some people can speak have, you know, can speak better than another person, you know, more eloquent or whatever. But um, when you, you have to look at the person and you have to look at their history and how they have uh, performed in, in the community, what their relationship to the community has been, and, and what they have produced or what they have not produced. Now, I'll tell you the one difference is that we won't say anything that's not the truth, whereas my opponent doesn't seem to have that same limitation. V.I. <laughs> <laughs> uh called... Uh, one of my opponents, anyway. One of, yeah. Well, you know, one of them called one of your opponents vindictive. Do you believe that, that to be true? I know people that, that got pink slips from the Snyder Map administration. And I, I just thought it at the time, just very um, vindictive might be the word, um, but to go out of your way to deliver those pink slips yourself, um, I thought it was really uncalled for. He delivered them himself? In many instances, in the instances that I know of, yes. And, um, but you know, and the people of the Virgin Islands have lived through some times where politics has been very much involved in whether they get a job or whether they get a, um, a contract. We, we're not that way. My, my running mate ran against me. And yet here we are together, running together. And we're a really good team and a, and a very close working team and we will be a team. Uh, when elected and so we're not about vindictiveness we're not about uh, having politics dictate everything we don't we won't care who, whose t-shirt you wore we're gonna we will care if you're competent if you have the experience for the job that you're seeking if you or for the um, contract that you're seeking you know that's that's what's important and what's important is making sure that our people are, are able to work and to ben reap the benefits of the economy that we intend to build. The last time I spoke to you concerning the economy of St. Croix, you said that it must start with St. Croix if we're going to see yes. the Virgin Islands moving yes. forward. Um, specific plans, I know we spoke generally about you know, the major things, WAPA, the refinery. What would you do immediately to bolster the economy of St. Croix? Well, I've checked and because there are projects that are already approved and funded and waiting. And it seems as though most of those projects that are sitting there not being implemented are on St. Croix. So one of the very first things, and I checked as late as a couple of weeks ago to 
find out if there was funds remaining in, in many of those. And, and apparently there are. I hope they're still going to be there in January. Right. But one of the very first things is to dust those projects off and get them moving. Yeah. That's going to create jobs. If it's funded, that's money circulating in the community. Um, it's going to help families. It's going to help businesses. And so we want to get that money going. Um, one of the other things that I think is really important is to make sure that we have a sound, comprehensive, and fully integrated financial management system. We, we need to be able to account for every penny that comes in here and how it's spent, and, and to be able to follow that. That will prevent us from losing money, to sending money back. I think it will go a long way to, to making sure that people don't get their grubby paws on the people's money. Yeah. You know, and, uh, you know, and it will make it more difficult to embezzle and to, to do some of the corrupt things that we're seeing surfacing these days. Um, so that's, a, that's another important area. But also, we hear a lot, you know, we need to grow businesses. And we hear a lot of things about the barriers that businesses face when they either want to open a business or they want to expand a business. So, one of the very first things also is to bring everybody, all of the agencies together that have any role in that process, whether it's DPNR, permitting, licensing, consumer affairs, trade, uh, corporation, trademarks, and look, find out, and maybe some of the stakeholders yeah. who've been experiencing right. it, to look at what those barriers are and how they can be fixed. That has to start in the transition, because by the time January 5th rolls around, we want to be able to say, here, legislature, these are the things that we need to do, or if it's something that can be done administratively, do it administratively. We want to make sure that we government does everything possible to support business. You want to hit the ground running. We want to hit the ground running, and we can, and we will. So people, people, the delegate, you know, next in line, she's just going to come in there and just be. You going, you want to hit the ground running. You're saying. You, and you know, the other thing that you hear a lot. Oh, I'm going to be the same old thing. It's you hear it a lot. Same. Yeah. Uh, come on. Who is satisfied with? where we are today. Who is satisfied? And I, you know, I realized that the last administration was hit with the recession, Hovenza closing. I mean, they probably had grand, grand plans for us, but um, it's not all their fault while we're here, why we're here. But, you know, I, we would do things differently nonetheless. And there are, there are things that all within government, besides the business, uh, barriers that do not allow our government to work, function efficiently and effectively, as effectively as it needs to be. And no matter, you can put the best people in the positions, and if those sy central systems are not working, whether it's property and procurement, finance, whatever it is, um, we, we're not going to be where we need to be. Right. So uh, we, we don't intend to be any other administration. We will not be any other administration, but we will recognize what benefits we have derived from all of the previous administrations and build on those. Right. Talking about corruption, of course you heard, uh, you must have seen also the Inspector General's report as it relates to uh, <laughs> uh, property auction and, and, and whatnot, and the, the vast amount of corruption, alleged corruption, that uh, might have went on there. Um, the report is really daunting. I know very disappointing, a lot of corruption. How will your administration be different? I mean, what, what would give people the confidence, the confidence that uh, Delegate Christensen, uh, that she is going to be different, it's not going to be the same? How would people be able to differentiate that? Okay, again, they can begin by looking at the two people who would be governor, lieutenant governor and knowing that our integrity is all, has never really been questioned. Yes, I've had a, a couple of in, ethics investigations that were brought for whatever reason, usually surfacing from somebody else, but they've never, I've, I've never been uh, accused, convicted or whatever. I've never been found to be in any ethical violation, despite all of that, because I have not been. So you look at the people that are involved. You need to set standards for your cabinet and for the entire government and starting with us and starting with the cabinet, a, a code of ethics that we must follow. Uh, and if it need, we may even get to be, have at least the cabinet signed. Um, you, we want to protect whistleblowers. We want to make sure whistleblowers know that if they see something, they can say something and they'll be fully protected. 
uh, in, in their jobs. But just to go back to the Lieutenant Governor mm. Inspector report, and I, this, I don't think that you're going to find that the actual Lieutenant Governor mm -hmm. is at fault in any of this. It's his office. I'm it's sure he'll office. take responsibility for yeah. it. But I think that the things that will probably surface, I would imagine, and I don't know, yeah. uh, will probably be below his level. But mm -hmm. seeing what was happening, not even thinking that maybe there was some criminal activity going mm -hmm. on, but seeing what was happening with the auctions and one person buying up everything, everything yeah. Yeah. I took it upon myself in 2012, May of 2012, to write to the governor, lieutenant governor, and ask them to put a moratorium on those sales, yeah. at, at the very least until they could figure out how to avoid that particular thing from happening. Yeah. And spoke to them subsequently as well, especially to the, to the lieutenant governor. So, I mean, it was really hard to read that, knowing mm. that, we, you know, I tried to convince them to put a moratorium on the property sales because I mm. saw what was happening and, to find out, and to find out that it's criminal activity. And you know, people here are frustrated, but sometimes we're frustrated because in the jobs that I, the job that Basil and I are in, and I'll just talk about me because you'll get a chance to talk to Basil, but in the job that I'm in, I can only take things but so far. Mm. I can ask, you know, but I can't do it. Right. And so some of that frustration that the people feel, we feel as well. And that's why we're running. Hmm. There don't seem to be any investigation going on. That's what people complain about, too. I, this, the, 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 that particular report at the very end said it was referred to criminal investigation. And I expect we will not, not know. Hmm. I have gone to the U.S. Attorney and said, you know, I'm hearing all these rumors. Can you tell me what's happening here? And he said, no. Hmm. I'm not, you know? So there's an, and an I ongoing said, investigation. I, I would, it's been referred for criminal investigation. And, you know... I'm very clear, and I tell him, I said, I'm, I'm only asking because it's a rumor. You do your job. I don't need to know. Yeah. I don't need to know. What, I, all I, you know, I hope that you are investigating hmm. the things that come up. And uh, I think it's very important to, we have so many cabinet hmm. positions that are really important, but the attorney general is one of them. Yes. And we're not interested in, again, politicizing things that should not be polit politicized. Um, we'd like, I think probably we should have a referendum on whether we should have an elected attorney general um, and see what the people think. So we want to make sure that that attorney general is able to do his job without interference. Yeah. His or her. Yes, yes. There's yeah. been, according to uh, many, apparent collusion uh, with the uh, current attorney general and um, certain cases that, that's been going on. We're not going to talk about that. I want to... Yeah, because I don't know about yeah, I want to... Um, I want to go into the, the same-sex marriage uh, issue. Remember we spoke about that then? Yes, we spoke about it quite a bit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was a long discussion, wasn't it? Yeah. But um, what is your sense? You would still sign it as well? You I'm going to I'm gonna hold the Constitution. Okay. And if... The Supreme Court, I noticed, did not take on any of those cases, no, but leaving it to the states. So it would be up to the Virgin Islands to make that decision. That bill is going to die. It's never going to come. It's not part of my agenda. I do not intend to introduce a bill in the territory. But I would defend the right because the people deserve equal protection under the law. And that's what the Supreme Court has said in almost every instance. That to deny a same-sex couple the right to marry is denying them equal protection under the law and therefore is unconstitutional. That's what they've said in some of the previous cases that they have um, heard. And if that is a fact, if the highest court of land has said that, I'm not going to deny anyone any right. But I will also defend just as fiercely the right of churches to follow the tenets of their faith and not be dictated to to ever be told that you must perform same-sex marriage. That's up to the church. That, that's where a, a separation between church and state is very, very clear. Yeah. And some churches will and some churches won't. Yeah. So, you know, we're not going to go along on this. It's, it's, it's always been, you know, I, I always want to know, would you sign it or not? Just simple. Would I sign it? You know, again, I'm going to answer it almost the same way. Bills should go through a process of community involvement, community opinion. Um, the legislature should debate it. 
if it got to my desk and it was not forcing, you know, churches to do something that they, their faith tells them is wrong, I, I would likely sign it. I would likely sign it. Um, you know, but, and I say one, I say two, I remember getting something in Congress requesting a, a change in the Organic Act, and it was passed seven to eight, and it had no public hearings. And so at that point, I decided, well, let's not the reduction of the Senate. Let's not mm. give them a specific number, but let's give the, the legislature the authority to um, determine what the, the size should be. Mm. You know, so because they didn't have that authority, they would have to go to Congress. If they said nine today and they wanted to make it eleven tomorrow, they'd have to go back and ask again. So we gave them the authority, the Virgin Islands, the authority to do that. And you know, so. Again, you expect full public input. I, I don't think people should be forced to accept things that they don't you know, want to accept. But I think the community is a fair community, wants to make sure people are protected, have equal protection under the law. And so I would like to sign it as long as the churches will be protected. Speaking of senators, you think we have too many of them? 15? So, you know, we gave the legislature and the people of the Virgin Islands to the legislature the opportunity and the authority to set the number of, of senators. I don't think, personally don't think 15 is too much, um, but there are many jurisdictions that have part-time legislatures that work very well. And depending on what the next constitution might do in terms of restructuring our government, especially the, the municipal government, I think everything ought to be on the table and maybe part-time legislators as well. Let's, let's, let's talk about a little bit uh, the, the, the Senator Alicia Chucky Henson situation. Of course, Governor DeYoung uh, pardoned her in the midst of a heated election season. Uh, the people, a lot of them, are kind of, you know, dissatisfied with what happened. They got to pay the taxes, and here is a senator being pardoned. Again, the governor has the right to do so. The question is, would you pardon uh, Alicia Chucky Henson during that time? That's, that's a very difficult question to answer because... It, I don't know all that went into it. I, I would say that governors have right to have the authority to pardon. I would also say that no governor, including myself, would condone people not paying their taxes. Um, I think there should be strong criteria to determine who gets a pardon. It's very difficult to say what I personally would have done in that in that situation. I have um, right now. I'm supporting. Well, it's not a pardon. It's a commutation from someone. I've, I've worked with former governors on pardons. We pardon people for murder, you know, so um, a pardon is possible for anyone. I, I do think that elected officials, law enforcement officials who are sworn to uphold the law should be held to a higher standard. But, you know, a lot of things go into making that decision and I think to answer that hypothetically, I'd, I, I, I'd refrain from doing that. You know, um what would make for better television would be, no, I would not. I know, <laughs> I know, I know. Okay. You know, and the newspapers made a point, one of them made a point of saying, you know, when Governor Turnbull pardoned some people, yeah. one of whom I was a pardon I worked on, okay. um, there was a big, the, the incoming governor, Governor DeYoung, decried that mm. pardon. Mm. I don't want to, I'm not going to lock myself into that. Right. I'm not going to lock myself into that, but I would tell the people of the territory that, um, should I be faced with a request for a pardon? I'm before, even before that, we would set, look at what is required and make sure that one sentence probation is all completed, that restitution has been made and there's a time certain for which that person has been an uh, upstanding member of the community uh, before a pardon would be given. And probably there's some other criteria I might want to add in because it's, it's, not, going, it's not an easy decision it's always controversial, always controversial, you know, and um, so that's where I am. We are one, less than one month uh, before election day, before November 4th. Um, first of all, I want to ask you this, how do you feel about your, um, you know, do you think you're going to win? And then I'm going to ask you to speak to the people directly as to what you would like to say to them. How do you feel about your prospects of winning the general election? I think the prospects are good. I think the prospects are good. I think as people come to know Basil and I more, I'm, I'm a relatively known entity. Basil may not be as well, 
but um, he's a very impressive person. And I think as people come to know us better and realize what the choices are, they will look at experience, relationships, know-how, past history of public service, and how we've, how we've dealt with that public service. And we will be the winning team. Awesome. We're about to close this. It's been an honor, of course. I know you're very busy. You had a long day. We had a long day. But yes. I'm sure you want to talk to the people of the Vision Islands uh, directly uh, before we leave as to why you want to be their governor. I've lived in the Virgin Islands, I would say, pretty much all my life. I, I love this territory. I have served it in many capacities in the past. But I, like everyone else, has to be disturbed by the condition that we find ourselves in today. Some of, some of our own making and some not of our own making. But we have to do better. And Basil and I not only know that we have to do better, we believe in the people of this territory and we know we can do better. Because we've, we've faced tough times before, we've come together and we have not only survived, but we, we've been able to thrive. And that's what Basil and I want to lead this territory to do again. And as we look at the challenges that we face, we know that we have worked on many of those challenges in our, our capacities before, but we've never been able to do the implementation to take them all the way through to where it impacts the people of the territory. We've seen opportunities maybe underused, we've seen opportunities missed. We know where they are. We will not miss an opportunity to serve the people of this territory. And so we have the relationships as well. We look around the territory we meet, as we meet everyone. We know that we have expertise and know-how and a lot of people in this territory that can help us to turn the, our economy, our social issues, and all of the challenges around. But we're going to need help. And where is that help going to come from? It's going to come from Washington. It's going to come from Washington. And it's going to come from corporations and organizations that have help other communities face those challenges. We are the only team, the only team that has those relationships. And we want to bring them to bear, to turn all of these challenges that seem to be burdening us so today, and turn them into opportunities for the people of this territory, for our children, and for future generations.